put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. The Hobbit, an unexpected journey in 3D and at a higher frame rate. When Gandalf, the Grey Wizard, comes by Bilbo Baggins, son of a Took and a Baggins, he, he discovers a little something, and it's not the first time he's met Bilbo, although Bilbo was too young at the time to be able to remember him anymore. And so he decides that he will join the party of dwarves as the 14th member. Yes, there are no less than 13 dwarves in this, so for those who really like Gimli, <laughs> there's more of it here. This movie actually slightly does for the dwarves what Fellowship did for the hobbits. You really get a sense of their culture, or like they're up. I didn't say that. That was, that was gall, I swear. And the, the real situation with them is that they have been driven from their lands. Something about wandering the desert for 40 years because their god was a really bad guide. And, you know, they, they like a lot of food, although we're not really seen if they would ask for more food if even if they didn't like it. Yeah, you can see where I'm going with this. I'm the first person to make a comment about their noses or their height. That wouldn't be very politically correct now, would it? And yes, I, I would probably make that joke myself if I wasn't scared of Israel. Anyway, it's a genuinely moving backstory, backstabbery, and we, we genuinely care about this, yeah, their, their drive forward. And they are led by Thorin Oakshield, who is somewhat bitter, and he's very proud. As we're told in the introduction, he was not aided by people he expected to aid the dwarves when trouble came in the shape of a dragon. And he now has a lot of trouble warming up to people, accepting anyone new, and he, excuse me, especially does not want help from those that he feels should have helped before. And it's a character that, if not done right, you'd really hate him. You'd really just get sick of him. There are moments where he really gets close to Emoville, but he never really sets foot in it. I didn't feel, at least. You, you understand why he is the way he is, and the 13 dwarves that I mentioned, not all of them are even warriors. Some of them are like toy makers, as mentioned. It's just kind of that they're the ones who were willing to show up, and they're, they're loyal to him. Loyalty is one of the themes here along with hope, friendship, 
love, loss, and sacrifice, yet again, as in Lord of the Rings. And, yeah, you, you really sympathize with him. And adding to that, Bilbo, who we now, of course, see much more of since he's the lead, and mostly no longer played by Ian Holm, but instead Martin Freeman. And while I don't know that much about Martin Freeman, he really fits the role. As I can understand, with Freeman you can... the Having him kind of play a little awkward and sort of British gentleman-like, sort of a little fancy and, and kind of expecting a certain amount of politeness from those around him, which he doesn't exactly get when the dwarves show up. It, it fits perfectly, you, you really believe Freeman as the character, and it really creates a great... We, we again have an unlikely hero, like with Lord of the Rings, but instead of just the Hobbit, <laughs> the dwarves, several of them, are also unlikely heroes. Again, toy makers. And... The... Again, Bilbo, this character, you could really easily find obnoxious. He is... he gets kind of whiny. <laughs> And it's the first adventure he's ever been on. And so he really, he hasn't left the Shire before. He's not, at least that's the impression I get. So he really doesn't have the, the skills you'd expect or the kind of the habits of someone who travels a lot. And again, they make it work. He's actually really, really likable, and yeah, I, I really don't want to give anything away, but there will be some, some characters will change over the course of it, and you really believe it. It, it comes across as so real. I've gotten so caught up in talking about this movie that I've completely forgotten to introduce with yet again, as I said in the Lord of the Rings videos, I am not really a fan of fantasy. I enjoy actual mythology, and it, in general, if it gets into interesting themes, I, I'm willing to give it a shot, at least. And I especially approach these movies, you know, starting with the Lord of the Rings trilogy, because the Lord of the Rings are fantastic films. You know, I kept being told by people whose opinions I trust on the matter of film that they're excellent. And so I gave the trilogy a shot and yeah, they are excellent. And thus I ventured further into Peter Jackson and have been quite impressed with his work. Not counting the old, uh, you know, gore, movies. I'm not really interested in those, but the newer movies he's done. I maintain that The Lovely Bones is crap, but he's a human being. He's allowed to misfire every once in a while. And this movie, it is really good. I think the reaction will depend, whether you like it or not, will depend very much on what you what you expect and if how how much more you want of sort of this world the critics seem fairly mixed checking metacritic last time i checked there were like 18 reviews and they were half and half nine positive and nine mixed no generally negative reviews but still and it's been like that. Like, the first time I checked, I think there were four or five, wait, ten, eight or ten total, and they were evenly split. And it's just kept going like that, evenly split. Again, still with no downright negative. And the complaints are often about that it's padded, that it lacks focus, that it's over long. Excuse me. And... I technically can't completely 
disagree with those, but what I will say is that I enjoyed the whole film and I want more. It, the, the movie is those two hours and 40 minutes or so and I want more. I, in fact, honestly I'd say I think I got more into this than The Lord of the Rings, which is not to say, I, I'm not sure they're t it's technically quite as good as The Lord of the Rings, or it's, it gets close, it's again, it's, it depends partly on what you expect and what you exactly want from it. The, where Lord of the Rings is epic fantasy, this is more of a standard, or standard, this is more of a fairy tale, he says, as if he's known the term, the genre term, epic fantasy, for more than two or three days. You can thank my good friend Kyramid Head from, for that. And you should definitely check him out, by the way, if you like reviews of movies and games, especially the horror genre. So, go sub. And, yeah, basically, The Lord of the Rings is more complex than this, and again, this is to be expected, it's the way it's supposed to be, basically. But this has some some qualities that I didn't really realize that I missed in The Lord of the Rings. I think I think I'll start by really expanding on whether you will enjoy this really depends on do you want to see more of the world of you know, Middle Earth, as written about by Tolkien, as you as seen in The Lord of the Rings. Because if you really sit down and look at it, Fellowship takes its time introducing, and then the next two movies have a lot of plot, which is very compressed. They're, they're quite tight films, the second uh, two chapters of the trilogy, after the first one really introduces you to the world. And this one, it doesn't have a lot of plot, and at times, it really sits still. It, it has a lot of exposition and takes quite a while to get going, and even once it's gone, gotten going, it takes a lot of detours, goes off on a lot of tangents. It's kind of like getting a story told by your elderly veteran, you know, grandparent or something. You know that they, like, saw World War II. They have amazing stories. And you really want to hear what they have to say, but when you get them talking, they're gonna go off on tangents and talk about these various other things that, you know, they kind of give more of an idea of the world that these stories took place in, but you kind of feel like, I didn't need to know that. It was, enough. It was cool enough to hear. And that basically, I feel like that sums it up. If you want to see more of just the world and more characters, this has a ton of characters including, I believe, Gimli's father. I'm pretty sure one of the 13 or so dwarves in the uh, company, Gloin. Gimli, son of Gloin. I'm pretty sure that was how he was introduced in The Lord of the Rings. And you also meet, I believe, Legolas's father. And we also have re you know, returning characters from The Lord of the Rings. And by the way, you do not need to have seen Lord of the Rings to understand and appreciate this, but there are some hints towards Lord of the Rings to where you you know when something is taking place by there's this has the framing device of Ian Holm basically writing the story down for Frodo to read later I believe and yeah you see Frodo going around Ian Holm as the aged Bilbo and you know yeah, various other characters, and it kind of places when he's writing down, when Bilbo is writing down the story, compared to when the Lord of the Rings movies take place. 
but without really, it, it doesn't spoil anything, and it doesn't assume that you've seen The Lord of the Rings. Now, th this, I should maybe talk some about the, the 3D and the high frame rate. The 3D is the avatar kind of 3D where it's very atmospheric, it, you feel like you're there. there there's, uh, the film opens with the dragon attack. And I love the use of perspective as well. It's very much the first person perspective where you feel like you're one of the dwarves being attacked. And you can practically feel the flames on your skin, you know, or, or near your skin. The, the heat from, you know, just being around the flames. And you don't really get to see the full dragon. And it keeps it very mysterious. And you, you really, really just want to see the full dragon and you don't get to. And that's... It's really cool. You, you're left really wondering what the full dragon looks like. And, yeah, in, in general, it just, it doesn't take too much advantage of it. It doesn't throw a lot of stuff at you. There's like, I remember one distinct shot where something is thrown at the viewer. And it was just so cool, so fun, a shot, that I completely forgive them. It was... I don't really want to say what it was, but look out for it in a battle scene. I think you'll know what I'm talking about when you see it. Now, the higher frame rate, this was shot with 48 frames per second, twice the usual 24. And this brightens up the 3D, and that's always been one of the problems with 3D, that it gets very dark. And it makes it extremely inappropriate for films that are already very dark. I've heard a lot of complaints about Transformers, for example, where, yeah, very, very dark. And it makes it difficult to see things and to make them out from each other. And that was never a problem in this. It, it definitely worked in that regard. Another thing it does is smooth out the motion, and it kind of has and, and making it feel more real through that. Now, there were times where it looked like a, a kind of fake digital footage. It has that, you know, digital footage can kind of look less real than, yeah, than, you know, less analog, I guess, film. And at times it has that. And also, Expect that for the first 15 minutes or so, it'll, some parts of it are going to look like they sped up the film. They didn't, it's just, it's your eyes adjusting to it. And once those 15 minutes are over, you're probably not going to have problems. I certainly didn't. There have been some reports of some people getting sick from this, you know, like, you know, some kind of motion sickness, I guess. and. If you are prone to such, you, you probably want to keep that in mind for this movie. And if, if you're too worried, I would suggest just going with regular 3D showings. Unless even those might be too much. And it, again, it's not a movie that's going to look really awkward in 2D, I would say. Yeah. I would definitely encourage you to watch the high frame rate 3D version if you're not worried about getting sick from it. Another thing I would definitely note about the high frame rate 3D is that I feel like it it's very draining, it's been very draining on my eyes, and I watched it with a friend of mine and he agreed. I would say you do not want to have used your eyes too much that they like really concentrated on uh, some reading or something or uh, on magic eyes I guess and you do not want to use your eyes too much after watching the movie. You'll want to make it the one thing that really drains your eyes that day and it'll be worth it I would say to say well okay this day I'm only going to be doing this as far as stuff that might you know make my ass kind of... It's, again, it's not really like pain or something and 
it, it really is just, it, it feels like I, I need to sleep, I, I need to close my eyes, you know, it's, it's an itch that I need to scratch or something. That's, that's really it. And it's perfectly acceptable to, yes. Now, something I will say which is going to sound weird coming from me is that if you're not that much of a fan of fantasy or of a Tolkien, this might be too much for you. This might be too long of a film that doesn't have a lot of plot. It really does not have very much plot. I literally tried to see if I could condense the plot of this into just 10 seconds or so, and I could, and I didn't feel like I was really losing something. And when comparing it to The Lord of the Rings, again, 2 and 3 are very densely packed. And the first one, stuff actually does happen, it just, it takes a little while to get going, and overall not much happens, but it was also very much, you know, the, the first the Fellowship spends its time introducing you to the world and getting you accustomed to that this is a fantastical world. It allows you to delve smoothly into a world that is not our own. This one doesn't as much do that, and it certainly has way more creatures than Fellowship. It's really more about just broadening this world. It's really not so much for someone who's not into fantasy. Again, I know how weird this sounds, having just gone over how I'm not actually into fantasy, but it's mesmerizing. There were several sequences of this where I sat with my mouth agape so long that I started to worry that a fly might go in there or something. It's, it's a beautifully done film. I, it might sound obvious, but Peter Jackson's eye in 3D and at a higher frame rate is just even better. It's breathtaking of a film. And again, I would also say that it's, it's, it's more breathtaking than Fellowship, as, you know, visually. Now, the... I meant to add, as first themes, there are... The greed and selfishness are very much the themes, and the... The, the three sort of ideas of, um, of Tolkien's of environmentalism, anti-industrialism, and pacifism, with war being, an un, being a necessary evil, not, not something you should seek out, are quite present. There's not an awful lot of industrialism or industry in this, but the environmentalism is certainly plentiful, complete with animism, which I read that Tolkien was, you know, had, had written, uh, had, had used in his writings, but which I didn't really see in the, at least in the Lord of the Rings movies, maybe it's present in the novels. This has plenty of animism, and for those who are unaware, it's the idea that all events and things, living or dead, living or dead things, have human-like intelligence. It's something, I believe, that children believe, children ascribe human-like intelligence to events and objects, even inanimate objects and all living things. And the... There is also this idea which Bilbo is very much a... He's, he's forming his identity and, and maturing over the course of the story, and it's also very much that he is sort of... He doesn't really belong in this more ancient world, and yes, I didn't actually... This, is, this comes from my research. I didn't sit down and note every single little 
thing, but I can definitely see it in the movie. It's present in the movie for those of you who enjoyed it in the novel. And yes, with, with the world being all the, the connecting tissue between the, the way there is a connection between Bilbo, who doesn't belong in this old world, and this old world is tradition and language. And yeah, this, this really gets that across nicely. And Gollum, as you see in the trailer, does make an appearance, and this is one of those cases where the, uh, yeah, language and tradition come, come into play, and it's, uh, it's an excellent scene. And you, you do, probably don't want to go just to see Gollum, I don't think I should really say anything other than that, but the Gollum is it's fantastic. They, they, yeah. Now, the... One thing I really will say that this... The, the, there's been, with, with it being a fairy tale, it's somewhat more accessible for children and it's, it's lighter. And this is actually the kind of film where I'd, I'd say I, if you have children or there, you know, there are some children who want to, you're, you're telling people that you're going to see it and there are like children who want to go and they're like, ah, related to you somehow, take them. They're going to love it and you're going to love seeing them love it. This is like, it, it has that quality of like a, a good Disney animated film where both the parent and the child can enjoy some of the same things and can appreciate some of the same things where it's there are a lot of jokes that the children can laugh at but that aren't too I don't know too they're not too immature although there certainly are immature jokes in this and there are some real gross hot moments, just be forewarned. Again, it's, it's stuff that the children can enjoy, it's not gory. But, but yeah, it's, a lot of them aren't immature and they're, they're really, the children can enjoy them and the adults can enjoy them. In, in maybe slightly different ways, but both will be enjoying the same things. And that's something I really want to say about this movie, that Again, like I said before, I really didn't realize how much I was kind of missing it from The Lord of the Rings, but this film is just full of charm. It is such an endearing movie. You really get into the characters and the situations and this world. You just, you dive right in. It's, it's not a slow going into this world. It's, it's a slow film, but it kind of just throws you into the world the way the... It, it surrounds you the way Bilbo's home is suddenly overflowing with dwarves he doesn't even know. You, it's, it's just there and you can't really ignore it, so you just... And, and that's where it really comes... That's where it really comes down to. Either you take that in and you enjoy it and you love it the way I did, or you're going to say, get the plot moving, come on, what do I need all this additional stuff for? I can, off the top of my head, think of several things in this that could have been caught, cut, that don't really add to the plot, that don't really need to be there, but I don't want to cut them. I know in my heart that basically, you could call them padding and you wouldn't really be wrong, but they're, they're fun, charming scenes. And the, the humor in this, which, of which there's, by, by the way, far more than in the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy, the humor actually works. It's a funny, funny film. There are a lot of moments that get real laughs. Again, some of it is the, the dwarves and their sort of, their, their culture and the, the culture clash between the gentlemanly Bilbo. Who is, who is soft-spoken and very just relaxed. He's, he's sitting on his porch just smoking a pipe, just enjoying himself, and suddenly dwarves come in and start eating all his food, 
and it's just yeah, it's it's really really funny, and they get all, they derive a lot of humor from the, the sort of difference between differences between them and the various dwarves who all have personalities. I couldn't name all of them or mention traits from all of them, but I also don't feel like any of them were just there, which is really impressive. I mean, it's, let's just go with I don't know, Expendables, Expendables Two. That movie has like six, you know, big action stars in the lead roles, roughly, give or take. This has twice of that as far as main characters go, and here they actually, they have lines, they have personalities. Yes, the movie is considerably longer, but again, it just, nothing feels like it's just there for no real reason. And the, yeah, the, the various characters actually are there for some point. Now, the... The, the dialogue remains in Old English, but without being impossible to follow without notes. And the... There are a lot of memorable lines in this, actually. Very quotable lines. Little... Yeah, jokey. Lines. I, I really don't want to give any of them away, but there, there's a lot of really great stuff in that. And it also has a lot of creatures. If, if you're into sort of fantasy creatures, or just you know, creatures in general, it has a lot. Various monsters, you know, including ones we haven't seen before. This has more creatures than... I'm not sure it's quite above the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy, but it certainly has a lot. And, you know, some, some of them, excuse me, some of them we have seen before. There are, there are some trolls and orcs, but there are also ones we haven't seen before, such as, again, the dragon. That exact kind, anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure we've seen any of the fire spearing dragons, anyway. And again, I don't want to give too much away, but yeah, and and they have again some really nasty looking orcs and trolls. I'd say they they're getting towards rivaling Return of the King in that regard. And they definitely have some really creative creature designs. Some You're really going to remember the various ones. The one played by Stephen Fry is absolutely disgusting looking and he is just so... he revels in the role. It's, it's so much fun. And there are a lot of these prototypical fairy tale creatures and sort of the the logic of them and their their motivations and the, the that whole thing that really feels very yeah i'd also like to say the those who felt that gandalf did not do enough magic in lord of the rings which i know that some people on like message boards did he does more trick magic in this one, and yeah, it's it's quite fun. The CGI and practical effects, you know, it's it's again a great blend of CGI and practical effects with amazing prosthetics, really allowing for immense expression. The, actually, the, some of the greatest expressions are those of. Gollum, but I'm gonna try to shut up about him. And it just, yeah, the, you really feel like they're all there. There was never a point where I felt, where, where I could tell where, where the live action elements, what, what were the live action elements and what were the CGI. And yeah, they're, they're really compelling. You, you really feel like this is just a vast world of various creatures. 
among the characters. They're again, you know, fantastically cast. You know, Gandalf and some of the others do look suspiciously like they're 70 years too old, considering when this takes place in the story, but let's not focus on that. Actually, Kate Blanchett, Yowza. If you're ever lonely, anyway, the the returning characters are a lot of fun, and the the various new ones are just really well cast. I've already mentioned Martin Freeman, but I really do want to hammer home. He's perfect for the role. I I can't wait for next year to see more of him as Bilbo Baggins. And while I don't know the actor's name, there is a wizard by the name of Radagast. I will say that his scenes were some of what could have been cut if Peter Jackson, out of the kindness of his heart, didn't want the hardcore fans to wait so long for the extended edition DVD, so he just went ahead and put that version in theaters. Yeah, Radagast would have been on the cutting room floor, but I am really happy that that wasn't the way it happened, because I love this character. There are these little things about him that you're gonna kind of realize, and there's just... It's just... He's, he's probably my favorite character in this movie, of, of the ones that are only in this movie, he's just, he's so, so much fun. Yeah, and, and in general there are these characters that just, you really fall for. And there are, there are moments, the character moments, where I kind of saw coming what was, you know, what, what the exchange was going to be. But I was still smiling all over my face when it happened. It's just... It's been a while since I was so transported by a movie that... Yeah. My friend who I watched it with compared this to Studio Ghibli. I think that's how you pronounce it. You know, Princess Mononoke, Grave of the Fireflies. And I, I agree, it's, it's highly atmospheric, and you have this, this ultimate kind of quality where, like I said, a child can appreciate it, and an adult can appreciate it. It's these kind of things that are forever, that you never get, you're, you're, never, you're barely ever too young to appreciate, and you don't really get too old to appreciate them either. Yeah, and the there are several various lands in this, about as many, I guess, as in the other movies, and they're, again, of course, nice and distinct and, you know, entirely credible. Now, I would actually say that the... I had heard that this didn't have that much action. I disagree. I think it has a good amount of it. And it's it's highly exciting. I think it has about as much action as the... Yeah, again, I'd say Fellowship. And again, keeping in mind that movie wasn't... It was slow about getting, getting going. It, it takes a bit of a break in the beginning of the film after the introduction, after the backstory is delivered. But once it gets going, there's a decent enough amount of story, and there are, you know, several action scenes. And this, again, also has several action scenes, and the climax is fantastic. It's a ton of fun. And it really doesn't feel like it's just trying to be a Lord of the Rings movie climax. It didn't really feel that much like one of the other movies. It, it was distinct enough. I, I didn't really... And that's again, you know, with all these movies, with all four movies, 
so far they're, they have nice distinct climaxes and the action is again this fast choreographed nice mix of being chaotic and still allowing you to follow what's going on so you understand what you're seeing happening and you know who's winning but without it being you know it, it's still there's there's so much that you can you can rewatch and just watch a different part of the screen when the action scene come, action scenes come up and you'll notice stuff you didn't notice at all before and without it being like loud it's not excessive and after an action scene is done you're not going to be able to recite the entire thing it uh, just it it happens too fast and so much happens it's it's a, it's a really big film it's it's very grand in scope now let me think that might actually more or less it. Now, part of the thing with the padding is, of course, the novel, the, the novel of The Hobbit is about three times shorter than the novels of Lord of the Rings, all put together. So it makes sense to make Lord of the Rings into three, almost three hour movies, but making three almost three hour movies out of The Hobbit makes less sense. It, it seems like that would be the one that you could fit into one three hour movie if it were to play by those same rules. But it feels like I, I haven't read the book and I didn't read extensively on it because I really didn't want to spoil the movie for myself. But it feels like it's just all from the book and, and some things added to tie it more into Lord of the Rings and to bring back the characters and the actors who wanted to do it again. Excuse me, and yeah, fit, fit all that in nicely. But it, I, I think what it really is is that this time Jackson didn't change much of anything, he didn't omit much of anything. And again, not knowing for sure, but that's what it really feels like. And again, what it ends up with is if you want more of that world, you're, you're really going to want to watch it. But if you don't really want, then it's... I, I really can't recommend you to watch it because it is... it's not very plot heavy and yeah, some, some people are going to feel like nothing really happens in the film. I think that does cover it. I sh should maybe briefly mention there's also this great... the, the villain is fairly traditional but he's quite enjoyable. I don't really want to give too much away about it, but it, it taps into a very typical theme and a very, yeah, a, a drive. And yeah, it does really well at that. I realized, I, I just realized I haven't really mentioned, it's of course, again, beautiful New Zealand locations and yeah, you, you really get into the the various areas. I don't want to give too much away, but there's there's some great forest stuff and yeah, some some very tense situations in in various situations in nature, various settings in nature. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.